Hello, hello, hello. We're so pleased that you're joining us today as we gather to worship God. I'm Sally Stewart, and I'm the pastor of Felton Viola United Methodist Church, a Reconciling Ministries Fellowship of Christ followers committed to the inclusion of all people, no matter who you are or who you love. Here on the East Coast in recent weeks, we've had not one, but two snowstorms and some very cold weather. So I hope that you're all staying safe and warm. As we start this new year, it's, hope, it's our hope that we can begin financially strong. The pandemic has been challenging. And although we've been able to meet our obligations, our reserves are low and even a small unexpected expense is difficult. If you value our ministries and can find a way to help us toward a more stable financial picture, we hope that you will do that. Giving is easy and the information on how to do that is on a slide at the end of this video. Thank you in advance for your generosity. We wanted to let you know that our mission team has been busy getting more supplies ready to go to Kentucky, where the tornadoes hit a few weeks ago. Sadly, it will take years for the area to recover, and they can use all the help they can get. If you'd like to contribute, they're looking for Walmart gift cards to send so that they can purchase the things that they need to survive. You can contact Jeannie Wood at davidwood22 at comcast.net. Just a reminder that our leadership team met this week to talk about the lo local COVID numbers and has decided to extend our pause of in-person worship for another two weeks. Please rest assured that we are watching closely and we will resume live worship as soon as it's safe to do so. We'll miss you all and truly want to be physically together. In the meantime, though, our Bible studies, our mission work, and pastoral care continue. So don't hesitate to contact us if you need anything or want to participate in any way. We're grateful to have this online version of the service. And if you know anyone who doesn't have access to the internet, but would like the service on DVD, that can be arranged as well. And now let's begin our celebration of the Lord's Day as we sing, This is the Day. Oh, oh, oh. 
us pray. You, O Lord, are almighty, endless in power and love. When we have no power to help ourselves, help us to know we can trust in you, in your presence, and in your power. We pray for the church that it may know its true resources and power are from you, that it may be enabled to proclaim your saving power and your love. Give your church the ability to be a healing instrument in the world, to bring peace, to proclaim your presence. We remember all who struggle for survival, the poor and the oppressed, the hungry and the homeless, all who feel powerless. We ask that your love may be experienced in our homes and among our loved ones and friends. We pray for homes where there is no conflict, violence, or abuse, especially for the anyone who lives in fear or has, who is unable to change. Give strength to the weak, refresh the weary, encourage the fearful, and protect all who are endangered. We remember friends and loved ones who are ill or in need of comfort and refreshment. We rejoice that you give us life in all its abundance and life eternal. We pray for all our loved ones departed that they may have the fullness of life in your kingdom. As followers of Christ called to his service, we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wedding wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. And Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think the story of Jesus turning the water into wine at the wedding in Cana contains one of the most powerful messages in all of Scripture. I've heard this passage talked about a number of times, with the emphasis on different parts of the story. Sometimes preachers or teachers focus on the issues surrounding alcohol. Alcohol is often a deadly and destructive force in today's world, as anyone who has lived with an alcoholic or has faced that addiction themselves can tell you. So sometimes it's used to make a point about the use of alcohol. There are some very good reasons for abstinence, or at least caution, regarding alcohol, but if you get too caught up with that part of the story, you might miss some other important points. Another thing that hangs people up in this story is the way that Jesus talks to his mother. Some people feel like Jesus is at least being a little bit rude to his mother. So they, they go off on tangents about obedience and cutting apron strings and the fact that Jesus gives in and does it anyway. Those discussions can be helpful, but I don't think they're the only reason that John put this, this story in his gospel. Which brings me to a third stumbling block for this story, and that is that the, it's the gospel of John itself. 
If you've ever read the four Gospels, the four accounts of Jesus' life that we have in the Bible, and read them one after another, you'll notice that John is very different from the other three. The other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all focused on telling the story of Jesus in pretty straightforward manners. Each one was designed for a different audience, so each one includes and explains slightly different things. But all three of them want to make sure that their readers get the facts of the story. This is what happened to Jesus. This is who we believe Jesus is. This is what Jesus taught. But the Gospel of John is different. John was not written to get the facts out there. John was written with the assumption that people already knew the facts about Jesus' life. John wants to tell his readers what the life of Jesus means, what the core message is really all about. To enter the Gospel of John is to enter a world of symbols and verses that have at least two or three levels of meaning. The Gospel of John is best read slowly and carefully, often with other people who might see things differently than you do. The only way you'll ever know what's going on in John if, is if you study John, preferably after you've read and studied the other three Gospels. John is highly selective about the material that's included, but because people don't realize John is talking in symbols and philosophy and metaphor, they allow themselves to get caught up in the details. Like, was it really wine or how dare Jesus talk to his mother that way? At best, they end up saying that this is a story about empathy. Jesus sees people who are embarrassed because they can't provide for their guests. Jesus feels their pain and helps them out. Good sermons can come from all of that, but all of those things sort of stay on the surface. The best way to get at John is to start out with the assumption that the message John wants to convey is below the surface, and the details of the story are just a means to an end. So let's approach the story with that in mind. Let's assume that this is not primarily a story about a wedding, about drinking, or about uh, those who scurried around to do what, uh, wh what with whom. It's in John, so it must be something more than that. The first thing to notice is that the Gospel of John doesn't call what happened here a miracle. In fact, John doesn't call anything a miracle in his gospel. Instead, the things that happened are called signs. The writer records seven signs in his gospel, and changing the water into wine is the first. We can assume that all that is intentional. This was a sign for people, something that would inform people about what they might expect from this guy Jesus, the Nazarene something that would point them toward a deeper meaning. None of the other gospel writers saw the miracle at Cana as something to worth, worth recording. They were much more impressed with the healings and the exorcisms. But John remembered Cana. John saw in the miracle at Cana a sign that served to define the purpose for which Christ had come into the world. Remember, it's only in the Gospel of John that Jesus is recorded as saying, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This statement, I think, is what the miracle of Ed Cana is all about. Water, the basic necessity of life, 
is changed into wine. All through scripture, water is used as a symbol of life. The river that flows through Eden, the water of the womb that nurtured the baby Jesus, the water of the Jordan where John the baptizer baptized so many, including Jesus. But in this case, water represents not just life, but wine, a symbol of abundant, joyous, and celebrative life. If you go into this thinking wine is evil, you miss the boat completely. Wine in scripture is a symbol of joy and warmth and celebration and lavishness. In changing the water into wine and allowing the wedding celebration to continue, Jesus is cluing people in on his mission. Jesus has come to transform the world. We often think of transformation in terms of opposites. We think of the ugly turned to beautiful, like Beauty and the Beast, or the kind Dr. Jekyll transformed into the cruel Mr. Hyde. Or we think of change to something converted to something new, like the caterpillar transformed into a winged butterfly, or the transformer toys that go from being a boat to becoming a robot. And it's true that God can and does transform people in those ways. God does take mean, ugly lives and transform them into beautiful angels of mercy. God does take us when we're crawling along on our bellies and give us wings to fly. God does take us when we're broken and make us whole. But there is another type of transformation that's modeled at Cana. At Cana, the object of transformation is something that's already good and pure and necessary. There's nothing that needs fixing about the water. Water is good. The message of transformation at Cana is not about making the bad good, but about making the good even better. Think about it for a minute. What if this message is about the law and Judaism? The jugs that, the Jew, that, that, uh, that Jesus had filled with water were the water jugs used for ritual purification and washing. They were there so that the wedding guests could comply with Jewish law. Jesus takes that ritual water and turns it into something that wouldn't satisfy the law. Washing your hands in wine wouldn't count. What if the deeper meaning that this gospel is trying to get across is that Jesus is making a statement about the law? Like the water, the law is life-giving, necessary, good, and pure. But Jesus came to transform the law into something that was not just necessary, but joyful. It wasn't the law that was ugly or evil or impure. What they had was good, but it was just the basics. Jesus came to transform the law through grace, to ramp up God's presence in it, to put more love into it, to make it more than just plain water, to make it wine, to give it texture, taste, let it warm you as the glow spreads through your veins. Let it free you to love and to laugh. Jesus came to take the wholesome duty of the law and make it giddy with joy. And that message that Jesus gave to the Jews at Cana, he also gives to us. This is not the message about the transformation of the sinner. John gives us that in the next chapter when he tells Nicodemus that he must be born again. This is the promise for those whose lives are really pretty good. The transformation at Cana is the promise for those who are pretty much on the right track. Those with a basic level of faith in God, who treat their neighbor with respect and mercy, who live a life of basic moderation, gentleness, self-control. This is the message 
for those whose life is like water, good, nourishing, life-sustaining. What if the message is lighten up? It's not God's desire that we live our lives with only a sense of duty and resignation. Of course, it's good that we obey the commandments, but there's more to life with Christ than obedience. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Not just life, but abundant life, joyous life, life lived in freedom. This doesn't mean God promises us material wealth. It doesn't mean we're promised a life free from pain and suffering. It doesn't mean you'll never do another task you don't enjoy. But it does mean that when the water of our lives becomes wine through the touch of Jesus Christ, that even the worst circumstances that life can offer have a richness and a depth that they never had before. So many times I talk with people both in the church and outside of it who only know the God of living water. Now that's good. That brings life. That makes the wounded whole. But it's not the whole picture. When I quote to them Psalm 37, 4, where it says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. They sometimes realize that God wants us to do more than dutifully drink water to sustain ourselves. God wants, us, wants to give us metaphorical wine that represents that joy-filled life that Jesus has brought abundantly. What I'm trying to say is that there is a part of the gospel that's about divine extravagance, not in terms of material possessions or getting our way all the time. Christian joy doesn't spring from the same source as the happiness of the world. Christian joy springs from realizing that once we have made the decision to drink of the living water of Christ, that water becomes wine as it touches our lips, that we serve a God whose name is not only duty, but love. It brings not just life, but abundant life, joy, freedom, celebration. What do people see when they look at your life? Do they see that you have access to living water? That's good. And those who are thirsty will be drawn to the source of that water. And if you remember the story, it's not just cheap wine. It's the good stuff. Does your life reflect the miracle at Cana? What would our lives look like? What would our church look like if we let Jesus turn our water into wine? Amen.